Let us pray. Most merciful God, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to seek and save the lost. Grant that today we would hear his call to us through his word, that we may believe and trust in him for forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life, and one day join all the saints who trust in him in the banquet that has no end. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The text for the sermon today is Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 9. Today in the gospel lesson that you heard, that was from Matthew chapter 13, we received a selection, final triad, in the third major discourse of Jesus. Matthew's gospel contains five major discourses. It's kind of a structure or framework on which the gospel is suspended, hung, if you will. And this third discourse, the discourse of parables, we've been working on this for three weeks, including today, three Sundays. It's at a time in the ministry of Jesus when there's rising conflict. Things are, are getting pretty bad. Increasingly, the Jewish leaders are vocally, openly, publicly coming out against Jesus and engaging him uh, in argument right in front of the people, for example, in chapter 12, just precedes this gospel lesson. In chapter 12, Jesus finds a man with a withered hand in the synagogue, and the Pharisees come up to him and say, so, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Notice that the enemies of Jesus aren't denying that he's healing. But rather, they want to trap him and in some way make him look like a lawbreaker while he's healing. It's astonishing. So he says to them, isn't it true that if one of you has a sheep who falls into a pit on a Sabbath day, don't you in mercy, don't you rescue your sheep? And how much more is a man than a sheep? How much more valuable so stretch out your hand, he says, and the man is healed. And this follows in verse 14. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Don't give glory to God for what God is doing in Jesus Christ. Don't give glory for the, for the mercy and the love that's being shown and the healing. No, no. Conspire against him how to destroy him. Destroy him. What a strong word, evocative word. Not just sideline him, not just push him out of the limelight, not just get him out of our hair, but destroy him? We're going to come back to that in a minute. Next, in chapter 12, Jesus casts a demon out of a man, and the Pharisees say, well, it's by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that he does this. Jesus counters with that amazing one-verse story in verse 29. How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. This is part of the whole house-divided talk that he gives, but this one verse just rings because after all, the strong man is the devil the house is the world. The one plundering is Jesus. He's bound the devil with the word. And the treasure that he's plundering, well, that's you. By the end of chapter 12, Jesus is demoting his own earthly family. They come to him and they want to take him home. We find out in Mark 3, they were literally saying, he's out of his mind. 
Come home with us. You're out of your mind. In John 7, his brothers make fun of him before the Feast of Booths. Go on up, Jesus. Go on up to the festival. Anybody who wants to be a famous prophet goes and does their works up there. For they didn't believe in him. His family came, wanted to take him home in Matthew 12. But he said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. And then follows chapter 13, the third major discourse, the discourse of parables. All of a sudden, Jesus is talking to the crowds in stories that they can't understand. And the disciples are puzzled. Why are you doing this, Lord? And he pretty much says, I'm talking to them like this so they won't understand. It's not because Jesus is being mean or evasive, or capricious, or rotten, or any of those things. No, the issue is that the crowds following him also don't believe. They're refusing to believe. They're not receiving the living word. They're just hanging on the miracles. Come on, Jesus, do another trick. I'm astonished and astounded. You're the latest craze. Cast out another demon. Heal another paralytic. Come on, Jesus, do a trick for us. So he speaks to them in parables. And by today's selection, the final triad of parables in chapter 13, closing out the third major discourse, Jesus has left the crowds. He's gone into a house with his disciples and closed the door. Wow. That doesn't sound like a very popular ministry does it? Doesn't sound like Jesus is filling seats. What's going on? What's going on isn't pretty because it affects us too. What's going on is sin. What's going on is a lack of belief. The world doesn't like Jesus. Jesus' message isn't popular. People today like to fret and worry. The church is in decline. The church isn't anything. The gates of hell shall never prevail against the church. What we're seeing in America instead is simply a little bit of gleaning that's going on. You see, it used to be culturally popular, acceptable, and and in some senses, enforced that if you're American, you go to church. When I was growing up, the streets were empty on Sunday and all the businesses were closed because going to church is what you did. It was very, very much a cultural thing. And if you weren't there, you got a phone call. Where are you today? Okay. Now that it's not culturally acceptable, we're not seeing the church in decline. We're seeing more of the church as it really is. And many of the numbers who would have been here out of cultural acceptance and looking good and not wanting a phone call aren't here because that's not going to happen anymore. The cultural pressure isn't there. We're not seeing a church in decline. We're seeing more of the real church as it always was, hidden in there somewhere. The message of Jesus is antithetical to the world. The world is prideful. The world believes I'm just, I'm righteous. The world believes I can save myself. The world wants to follow a Jesus who's a guru with some sound advice. Maybe a therapist to hold your hand and give you attention. A universalist who lets everybody in. Somebody who comes in power like a knight in shining armor on a war horse and clobbers our enemies for us. Oh, and fixes our relationships and, and uh, oh, and puts money in our account. And Jesus comes instead in weakness and suffering and surrender to the will of his Father. He comes with the word that we are sinners 
before a holy God that we are helpless to save ourselves and that nothing short of a Messiah who loves and who dies for us will save. And the world hates that message. We shouldn't look for the gospel to be popular when it put Jesus on the cross. We shouldn't expect the world to like even what we have to say as Christians, and I know you've experienced this, the mockery, the jokes. You're one of those, aren't you? One of those Bible thumpers. One of those backwards people who can't really understand science, so you have to rely on your imaginary God for answers to things you can't understand, etc., and so forth. They don't despise you despite the gospel. They despise you because of the gospel. Remember, Jesus said, if they hate you, they hated me first. And that is so incredibly true. But what about this message today? There is a message of hope coming our way. The message of hope is this. That though we once were just like the world, lost dead in our sins and transgressions. The enemy of God, conceived and born in sin, wanting nothing to do with him, in spite of that, God chose us. This is the ringing message of hope in Deuteronomy 7. Let's go to that text. Deuteronomy 7. We're going to look at verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. How can that be? How can that be when the flesh and the devil and the world is constantly dragging us down when we know we can't get through a single day without sinning against God? Sin is lawlessness. It's breaking God's law. How can we possibly be a people holy unto the Lord our God? It's because he makes us holy. This is great news. In Jesus Christ, by grace, through faith in him, God imputes to us the righteousness of Christ. And so when he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin, but sees the righteousness of his son in full submission to his will, stretched out on the cross, bleeding out his life in full payment for the sins of the world. We have no holiness intrinsically, but we are covered with the righteousness of Christ. By grace through faith in him, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Notice, we didn't choose him. He chose us. It has to be that way. Why? Because people conceived and born in sin who are dead to God aren't seeking him, aren't choosing him. They're dead. We are conceived and born in original sin. The very enemies of God. Running away from him, he chose us. Now Deuteronomy continues talking about Israel saying things like, it wasn't because you were more in number, and certainly it wasn't because they were more righteous, and certainly it wasn't because they were rich or had anything to offer God. That's us. We have nothing to offer God. He simply chose us and chose us for his treasured possession. The Hebrew here is segala. It's an interesting word. It's prized. It's special. It's not just something owned, but something absolutely treasured. This word in the Septuagint, the Greek, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, parapoiesis is how they translate it. That itself isn't important, but where it shows up again is hugely important because that word shows up in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Now listen to this good news. 
but you are a chosen race. There's the chosen again. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. There's holy again. A people for his own possession, treasured possession. There it is. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Do you see? It's like the parable of the weeds. You're the good seed. You're the wheat that was planted. And there's weeds all over the place. That's most of what the field is, but you you're a chosen people. The treasured possession of God. And that brings us to the gospel lesson today. And we're gonna, let's put that up on the screen. Because wait until you see this. The parable of the hidden treasure. Verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Field. Now, the traditional interpretation of this is called the discipleship model. And according to this, the discipleship model, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, Jesus, hidden in a field, which a man, you, found and covered up. Then, in his joy, your joy, you go and sell all that you have and buy that field. In other words, Jesus is worth so much that it's worth it to you to go and sell everything and get you some Jesus. That's a traditional interpretation going all the way back. Irenaeus, bless his heart. If you're from the south, you know what that means. All the way back in the second century. I'm sure you have heard this interpretation before. Now throw it out because it's wrong. When we interpret Holy Scripture... We're Lutherans. When we interpret Holy Scripture, we interpret it through the cross of Jesus Christ. And that makes the doer in redemptive passages, and certainly in kingdom passages, the doer isn't man. The doer is Jesus. Now hear this good news from the right interpretation. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure, you, hidden in a field of weeds, which a man, Jesus, found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, his life, and he buys that field. Now you got something. You are the treasure. He knew it all along. God chose you in his mercy and his love in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. And though you and I were hidden in that field, that tremendous field, massive amounts of weeds... He found the treasure, you, his chosen, his elect. And he went and he sold all that he had, gave up his life that by grace through faith in him, you're forgiven, you're saved, you have eternal life. In the language of Philippians 2, though he is in fact God, he didn't consider equality with God something to grab on to, to hang on to, to remain safe and secure in the glories of heaven, but instead humbled himself. He took on human flesh and in the form of a servant was obedient even unto death on a cross. Jesus spent everything, his life, for you, to redeem you, to purchase you by his blood, to wash you in his blood, to present you to himself holy and blameless, that you may spend eternity not separated from him in the fires of hell, but with him in the banquet feast that has no end. 
in spite of your sin and mine. This is astonishing. You're the treasure. And it's not like we had something to offer him. We're the treasure he dusted off and uncovered. The treasure that was thumbing our nose at him. The treasure that was screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And he paid anyway. The parable of the pearl of great value looks a little different. It's a little bit confusing. We're going to step through this. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant. Well, in the parable of the hidden treasure, the kingdom was like the treasure. Now it's not like the treasure. It's like the merchant. So that's different. In search of... Of pearls, So this is about searching. The first one was about joy. Who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. In the first parable, he buys the field and the treasure. In this one, just the treasure. Even the verb tenses are different. In the parable of the hidden treasure, then in his joy, he goes, sells all that he has and buys. All present tense verbs or what we'd call the historical present because it's in a parable. In the pearl of great value, everything is past tense. He went, he sold all that he had, and he bought it. But don't let those differences throw you. The common refrain tells us that these two parables are about the same thing. In both, the man goes sells all that he had and buys. This is the same thing. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant, Jesus, in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, you, went and sold all that he had, crucifixion, and bought it. Peter tells us in his epistle, you were bought and paid for, not with gold or silver, but with his most precious blood. We know from Holy Scripture that now you belong to him. We no longer belong to ourselves to chase the passions of the flesh. We belong to Jesus, and in him now have the freedom to do the things we never could before. Freedom to believe in him, freedom to love him, freedom to follow him, freedom to serve him and our neighbor. It's tough to do that sometimes because we are yet in the flesh, but there's another word of hope coming for the third parable in the triad is about the net, and this is how that one works. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. The net is word and sacrament. It's the Holy Church. It gathers fish of every possible kind. All nations, right? When it was full, men, angels, drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers but threw away the bad. And then he explains, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them, the evil, into the fiery furnace in that place. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so the mission continues. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Jesus was in the tomb. Jesus rose. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father. But the mission continues. Until the time of the resurrection, the church and her mission of word and sacrament ministry before the whole world, it continues, and you're a part of that. We are not passive spectators of some kind of entertainment, but rather, we are Jesus' hand-picked children who are supposed to go out into the world carrying the gospel to everybody. And until he comes again, the church is going to be 
a pretty interesting place. You know this for yourself. There's all kinds of fish in God's church. We can't see the heart of man, but he can. And so he knows some are good, some are rotten. <laughs> and the truth is, is that sometimes in this church, you're going to be hugely disappointed. You're not going to get your way. Things will happen that you don't like. People you trust and believe in are going to let you down. None of these are reasons to abandon the church or to jump out of the net. In the visible church, in this life, there are true believers and there are posers. These days, we're getting a much better picture of the true believers, aren't we? Aren't we? Because it's no longer just culturally acceptable. There's no cultural motivation to be in church. Actually, the church today is maligned and scorned. In this church, you will suffer. In this life, you will suffer for your trouble in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will be put down. You will be mocked and persecuted and scorned. You will be made fun of. You will have your feelings stepped on. But take heart, Jesus says. I am coming again, he promises. And when he comes in glory with his angels, the trumpet blast, we will be raised again in new and glorious bodies, no longer affected by the travesties of this world. No more obstacles in the way, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more medical problems and financial concerns and worries, and, and, and no more sin. New and glorious bodies confirmed in original righteousness. And the angels are going to sort them out. And by grace through faith in Jesus, you'll receive the crown of life and enter into glory. There to stand in his presence and sing his praises. You're the treasure. In all the world, you're the treasure. Whether it feels like it or not, you're the treasure. In the midst of pain and suffering and sorrow and worry and anxiety and persecution, you're the treasure. You're the treasure. Jesus Christ loved you so much. He suffered. He died. He paid for the sins of the whole world. And now by faith in him, your guilt is gone. Your shame is taken away. You're spotless and clean in the blood of the Lamb. And you're covered in his righteousness before the Holy Father. Rejoice and be glad. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.